Today I'm going to go through the other administrative components for the patient uh, encounter file. So I'm going to take you the path through the menus, but you have several different ways you can get to it. There are links and icons within other areas of the application, as well as you can go down the side of the home page a little further down and see some uh, links and information sitting down here. So you would be able to get to it from there as well. So I'm going to go to the patients menu and I'm going to select my patient encounters option. Now think of patient, uh, a patient encounter as a start of care. They, they, CMS changed the terminology back in, I think, the late 1990s or early 2000s. So they refer to it as an encounter, but it's really uh, a start of care. So I'm in the patient encounters. I've selected my option. On this screen, you're going to be able to add a referral from this page. So if you're on uh, this screen, you can select this link to add the referral. It takes you the exact same path as this menu and this option to add your referral patient. So you can, this is the other way you can get to add, add a referral if you're here. Sitting next to this is our help link. If you hover over it, you're going to get a list of the help topics that pertain to this module. So uh, the top one's the listing, which is what you, <coughs> excuse me, what you see in the background. Then the rest of these are uh, relate to the tabs that are within uh, the patient encounter file itself. There is one out here uh, that's called a header, so it does explain the information for the header that's over all those tabs. Now you can run a census report from here. So if you want to run a census, let's say you wanted to run it from uh, December of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 1st to December 31st, you would wanna make sure that you hit your search so it'll redisplay the screen for the information that should be within the census time frame. Then to create the census report, you do want to change this from a PDF because this will just give you the standard listing to the spreadsheet version and then hit the export option in your report will uh, display on the screen. <clears throat> Since this is a spreadsheet, uh, depending on your browser and uh, the version of the spreadsheet you have on your system, you might get a pop-up window that uh, says you have an older version uh, than, or a di <coughs> different version than the current version uh, that we create the spreadsheet in. Or uh, like I have with my new, new browser, you might get a message down in the bottom left-hand corner to open uh, the file, which will open the spreadsheet for you. Now, when you're working with uh, search criteria, you can put in a date, a medical record number, if you know that. And here, here's that identifier information again. The identifier is the one that will look for a, a Medicare uh, beneficiary ID or a Medicaid number or a policy number or Social Security number. So that's what that one does. This search is just the opposite of the search that's in uh, the referral process. When you want to set up the patient, this search, if you put in criteria in every one of these fields, it has to meet all the criteria. Whereas the re referral search when you're um, setting up the patient will look for at least one of the criteria. So it has to meet one of the criteria where this one it has to meet all the criteria. You can search by patient's first name or last name here. And whichever search feature or features you're using, just hit your search button. Okay, now the column headings that display on this screen allow you to resort the information based on what's in that column. So, for example, if I select my team heading, it, this will put it in alphabetical sequence, lowest to highest. So, I have none for a couple of them. I have IDT group one and group two. 
if I uh, go the opposite direction, then if it, it sorts it from the, the highest to the lowest. So it goes just the opposite. And if you select it one more time, then um, it will put it back in the original sort sequence. Okay. Um, you also have some filters on this screen, so you can filter by agency. Uh, you do have three separate agency set up, so if you need the list by an individual agency, you can uh, you can uh, filter it. Also, you can filter by the type of agency because it looks like you have three agencies set up. Uh, you may, it could just say all, and if you filter by uh, an individual agency, it may all be all your hospice or it may all be your home health and so on. Then you've got um, uh, your, your status. Now, this, this screen, the drop down looks the same for both home health and hospice. So you'll see these options listed in home health as well as hospice for this list. Um, but, and it's going to default to active, hold, and pending. Uh, the ones that are on hold, you typically can put your patients on hold uh, for a home health agency, like if they, um, are transferred to a facility sometime within the certification period and then you reactivate them during that same time frame you can put them on hold you will have the whole clinic sitting over your hospice patients since that's connected to your organization so uh, you typically don't put your hospice patients on hold you you add your new referrals activate them and either do a live discharge or you a discharge to the bereavement program. You can filter by tenure. Now, uh, some locations, uh, and in your case, you are, you are split up between home health and hospice. If you had the whole list and you wanted to see those that were set up for the Medicare hospice payer, you'd be able to see it. <laughs> Then you can also filter by payer category. Now keep in mind these payer categories are standard in the system. So your Medicare, Medicaid, insurance, uh, third party, and so on. So if you really need to filter more by payer, then you'd use the payer name filter. Now, if you change any of these filters, let me just go ahead and change one of them real quick. You can lock these filters down. So if I want to lock this filter down, all I have to do once I make the changes to the filters is select this little lock icon. Now it's in a locked status. So now every time I come back uh, and, and visit this screen, it's going to keep this same set of filters until I make a change to a filter and I'll lock it back down again and then I'll keep my new set of filters. When you're looking at the detail on the screen, uh, you're going to see a little address book. If you hover over it, you'll see all the demographic information for the patient. Those lines that are bolded have the preferred phone number associated with them. So that's why they're bolded. So this would be another reason you want to make sure you have the preferred phone number checked, especially if you have multiple uh, phone numbers in the file. Now for hospice, which is actually the one you're looking at, you're going to see uh, the benefit period for the patients. If you have a patient sitting out here for home health, you won't have a benefit period listed here, but you'll see it for hospice. Now, uh, the patient name itself is a link to take you over the patient encounter file. So that's really your uh, patient's electronic medical record. So that's how you get into the patient encounter record from here. You can also select the view patient icon that is sitting over at the far right of the screen. Either path will take you into the patient encounter record. I'm actually going to select one of these. And so now I'm in my patient encounter. So this is really where your electronic medical record is saved. And this is where you'd be um, adding, updating, changing, ending 
uh, specific areas that uh, are within the patient encounter file itself. So let's talk about the top piece first. You have a couple of uh, links sitting up at the top. Now, because I've got an active patient now, I have my uh, discharge patient link. Uh, if, if this was a home health agency, I'd have the whole link. I'm actually just looking through the hospice file at the moment, but if this were a home health agency, you'd have a patient hold link up here. You'll have the patient fact report and you'll have your scheduling link. Now, if you activate a patient and you didn't use the link to schedule initial assessment, that link will be there. Once you do that, then you'll have the scheduling link. If you create a pending patient encounter and uh, you decide at the time that, at that point in time that you're not gonna bring the patient on service, you'll be able to uh, make the patient a non-admit. So that link will be up there as well. So links are going to change based on the type of agency you're in and that the patient's assigned to really and the status of the patient. Okay, you do have the status information sitting on this screen. So I've got my status icon that's sitting next to the status. If I hover over that, it tells me I can view the status history. You can select that little icon and here's your as, to, as a patient status history. So it shows when you initially added uh, the referral into the system and it shows when you activated it. <coughs> For home health, if you put the patient on hold, it will take it from active to hold. If you reactivate them during the same certification period, then you, you'll see it go from hold to active. You'll also see it go from active to discharge when you discharge the patient. If you do put the patient on hold and later on discharge and don't reactivate them, it will show you from hold to discharge. Okay, uh, the rest of this information comes from a variety of different places within uh, the patient encounter. So when you first enter the referral, you'll have some of the information already populated at the top of the screen. When you uh, activate the patient, you'll have other things show up like your start of care date will show up for the day that you um, activated the patient. Once you start entering information into other areas of the application, they'll start populating up here as well. So once you put allergies in, which is in your care plan, then the allergies will show here. Uh, once you put in your disaster level, it will show up here. If you have uh, DNR information on file or what it is, it will show here. Any of your advanced directives that, that you have set up will show here as well. Anytime you make any changes to any of these areas, then it will update the, the, the uh, basic information or the header information. When you discharge a patient, you'll see the patient being discharged. Okay, now we start on the profile tab. So the pers personal information and current in encounter information initially started with your referral. And so it will populate as much information as you entered in that referral. When you activate the patient, it's going to uh, update the information for this current encounter. And so there's some key things in here. You can edit all of, all of these different sections as necessary. So if you didn't have some of the information in here, like gender, race, marital status, email, and you wanna put that information in, all you have to do is select your edit link in these various sections on the tab. Now for your current encounter information, <laughs> The encounter number, just consider that every time you discharge and readmit a patient, it changes the encounter number. So when you add a patient for the very first time, it's going to start with encounter number one. Then if you discharge that patient and readmit them, it's going to pull it up as encounter number two. 
than if you discharge the patient. Again, when we admit them later, it's going to bring it up as encounter number three. So that's what the encounter number, number is. It's just a different start of care. Now, once we activate the patient, we pull the information from the contact tag for their home address. If you did have multiple home addresses and you needed to uh, make sure you had the right one, you would do that when you're activating the patient. Now, there's a, another one down here for county. Now, we have the national zip code uh, county cross-reference table in our system. And so, uh, we will go ahead and assign a county based on the, uh, the zip code for the residents where you're providing that service. There are some zip codes that cross over uh, counties. And I usually see this more in rural areas where it's on the highway. A patient lives on one side of, of the highway and they're in one county and another patient lives across the street from them and they're in a different county. So you want to make sure that you, if you have one of those situations, that you have the appropriate county assigned as this helps drive uh, the billing information as well as your reimbursement if you identify the appropriate county. So if you need to change your county, just select the little icon that's sitting next to it. And then if it's going to be a different county, all you have to do is select a different county. So it's relatively simple. So you would have to know that somebody's in a different county uh, than what we've actually posted. And that's really for those zip codes to cross counties. Okay, and then the rest of this information uh, really comes from uh, the referral and when you activate the patient and some things do get updated uh, when uh, you make changes like your uh, DNR could be updated if you made it a, a made a change to it. Now, for the difference in this screen for, than from home health is that you, if you are involved in the evaluate-based purchasing program for um, home health, you're going to have some additional features down here uh, that you don't see for a hospice patient. Okay, so the next tab I want to move over to is the, uh, does the encounter number track to all three agencies? It, actually, it does. So if you admit them in home health, it's an encounter number one, you discharge and admit them in hospice, if you can readmit them, even though you're admitting them in hospice for the first time, it does count as, a, as encounter number two. So it actually does do that. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is the contacts. Now, during the referral process, uh, you would enter uh, the contact information, which was step three of the process. And so all of the information that you enter there populates the contacts tab. And if you need to make any changes or updates to it, so this is where you put the information. Now, when you're adding information to uh, this, like if you needed to add a mailing address, you can select add contact info so that you can put the mailing address in. If you need to make any changes to anything that's sitting here, you can edit it. Some items you will be able to delete, but you can, if you have a, a home address and nothing else, you will not be able to delete it. You can make changes to it, but you won't be able to delete it. So even though it says delete here, it is not underlined like these other links are. So you cannot delete this one. So the only thing you can do is edit. Now I'm gonna select one of these. When you add uh, the address and phone information, it's the ad screen looks exactly like this edit screen, except it's going to say add address and, and phone information versus edit. You're, you're going to be selecting the type of addresses you're adding. So you, if you need to add a mailing address, you can do that. If you've got work address, you can do that. Then you've got uh, your address, two lines of address information. 
At minimum, you need the first line of the address. To be straightened with, all of this is required. The, the plus four is not, but the rest of it is. When you're adding phone numbers, you can add multiple phone numbers, so you can select a phone type. So I already have a mobile phone and a home phone. Let me just stick a fax phone, a number in here. And add my phone. And so this is where you'd be adding multiple phones to the same address uh, type that you're adding. And then remember, if you're when you're adding phone numbers, be sure you have one checked as preferred. Even if you only add one phone number, you want to make sure you've got it checked as return. All I have to do is save these. So the add feature is pretty much the same as the save feature. Also on the screen, this is where you want to put in your service facility information. And so um, your service facility is where actually where you're seeing the patient or what type of facility uh, the patients are in, and that's where you'd be providing the service. So if you're providing service in an assisted living facility, a skilled nursing facility, a nursing home, a hospital setting, a hospice a home, and so on, you want to make sure that that service facility has been added. That's the link up at the top that says add service facilities. So if you're not seeing them in their home, but you're seeing them in a facility, you want to put that information here. Also, when you do this, you will, you will be identifying the type of facility there. And uh, this one happens to be in an assisted living facility, but you'd be able to identify uh, different types of facilities uh, there in where, where you're providing that service. <clears throat> Now, if a patient comes out of one assisted living facility or comes out of one facility into another one, make sure you put an end date for the first facility. And when you add the next facility, make sure it has a, 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 the start date after the end date of the other one. So that's what you'd be doing. Also, if you are adding of a, a facility for a patient, you might be seeing somebody in an assisted living facility, and they're now going to be uh, living with family. So that that would be that would classify as their home. You just want to make sure that you come in and add it to the place of service and put in an end date so that they're no longer in the facility. The facility information that sits here. Excuse me. Is is uh, determine the, the HICTIC or billing code that goes on your claims. And it does that for both home health and hospice. Ancillary phone information, 95% of the time I see this information blank. Uh, but this would be an example of when, when you might uh, need one. You just stick in a phone number and put in the description with it. So I stuck in a phone number and said, call neighbor, patient doesn't answer the door. So they could be hard of hearing, they could be bed bound, and, and nobody else is there to open the door, then you can call the neighbor. Okay, so patient contacts. You can add as many contacts as you like. I have two in my example, but you can add a third one. Now, when you're adding patient contacts for, for home health, and I'll just go ahead and add one as if we were doing this for home health because we're in a, um, let's add another brother, and I'll just add a couple of them. If this person for hospice is going to be involved in the bereavement process, you would check bereavement. So that would be for your hospice patients. If they're not, then you wouldn't need to worry about that one. When, if you're going to check bereavement, when we get to the next screen, you'd want to make sure that you collect their their address and phone information. So I'm going to add this for one that isn't going to be in bereavement and in, in the bereavement program. And this is um, uh, what it's going to look like. Okay, so I've, I've checked brother next to kin and so on. 
I don't need a date of birth. You probably won't be collecting that for your home health agencies. I don't need to worry about sequence right now. And then if you need to collect an email address, you can type that in. Now, if you do select a family portal, which is available for both home health and hospice uh, environments, if you do uh, select family portal, then you would want to make sure you have an email address. As a matter of fact, I think it gives you an error, you know, put the email address in this field if you have family portal checked. Now, um, if you're going to uh, be assigning family uh, portals to contacts, uh, it, you would probably want to obtain permission uh, from the patient to make that happen. I've seen where some of them have added that to their service agreement, where a family portal, uh, who do you want to have access to it? You, it could be the patient themselves and any of their family members. Okay, I have another question. We would like to verify that the patient portal is also available for private duty. Uh, the, uh, the patient portal is available out there for everything. So when you're adding a, 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 a patient, the, po the portal's out there for the patient, so you could add it. And it all, it's also out there for home health and hospice. So yes, it is. It will be available for private duty. Okay, now the portals work off email addresses, so you can't have people get email addresses uh, when you set individuals up for the portal. Okay, now on this page, where I hit my continue to move forward, on this page, you've got a couple of little asterisks for address city, state, and zip. This, if you change this address type to one of these three, then, then the address city state and zip is required. If you leave this at select, then the address city state and zip is not required. You can bypass it. A lot of agencies do not collect uh, contacts, address city state and zip for home health, but they do for hospice. So <clears throat> uh, if you do need the address, you can put it in. Just know that. If you leave this at select, that's how you can bypass this if you're not collecting the address information. And then here's your phone information. I'll just go ahead and put in a phone number. And hit my add. And then uh, you would want to check, even though I'm only going to add one, I want to check it as preferred. So again, if they're going to be involved in the bereavement program and you check them as a bereavement, like this individual has checked that they're involved in the bereavement program, then you'd want the address. This one's checked that they're involved in a bereavement program, you'd want the address. This one is not, so all you're interested in is a contact phone number. So that's how you can bypass um, having to collect address, city, state, and zip for somebody that you don't need it for. I typically see that for um, <clears throat> home health agencies where they just collect a contact's phone number. I typically see the addresses collected for everyone, every one of the contacts for hospice, whether they're involved in the bereavement program or not. But you have a little bit of flexibility how you want to uh, collect some of that information. In all cases, you should at least have that one phone number. Okay. Now, when you're adding contacts, and I did add my third one, let's say you wanted this person sitting at the top, just select the edit. The sequence number that I told you to go and add, if you were adding seven, seven of them in here, then you can add all seven, seven of them and then reorganize them the way you want. So if I wanted this person to be sitting at the top, I'd select it as sequence one. And it's to it move that, that individual to the top, move the one that was there down to the second place, and now in the second one down to third place. And again, you can add as many contacts uh, as you want in here. It's not limited to three, five, seven, ten. So add as many as you think you need for 
<clears throat> the patient wants you to have. I think the most I've seen out here is five. Okay, so that's the contacts tab. Now I want to go to the notes tab. In my notes tab, I do have some notes that are already in uh, the system. <coughs> so when you're adding a note, this is where you can add any type of comments, a free form text, and organize it by the type of information you're putting in. So this, when I'm adding the note, I'll select the add note link. And you'll see um, I have options to select from. This is a table that you can manage uh, for uh, the, uh, your agency. So you would be able to uh, add different types of uh, notes that you want in here based on the type of information you'd be entering. So this is the table I have in my training environment. You could have some different things in your production environment. So a couple of the notes, um, I'll just, I'll cover some of them. Um, this might give you some bereavement instructions. And so you could use that and label it as a bereavement note. Um, directions, a lot of locations, but then just general directions like major cross streets, because most people use the mapping on their phones these days or tablets or whatever they're using. A fax document. You do have the ability to fax documents to uh, physicians and they're really the orders. Uh, you can fax to the physician. There's uh, some, I think the medications list you can fax. So there are some documents you can automatically fax through the system. It will write a faxed document note on the notes tab and tell you what it is that was faxed. There's a general note. This is just a general category. So if it doesn't fall in to any of your other ones, uh, you could have a general note. I've seen somebody change, uh, change this to say miscellaneous notes instead of general notes. They thought miscellaneous made more sense to them. So, and again, this is a table you can control. Letter generated. There is an area in the tables where you can enter your uh, bereavement letters. And so when, once the patient's been discharged and goes into the bereavement program, then it will start sending the letters. And there's uh, 13 letters in the series that you can put in. It'll know to send the second one, and then 30 days later, send the third one, and 30 days later, send the fourth one, and so on. So, um, for your hospice patients that need the bereavement letters, that is available to you. Uh, missed visits. Uh, you may decide to use this type of documentation. This was actually added to uh, the tables early on. Um, and the reason for that is this is where you could document why you missed a visit. Well, we've changed the cancel services process so that you can document all the information as to why you missed the visit and create a case communication. So that would be available, would be available to you. It's out there now as part of the features. So if you have a missed visit um, uh, in here in the table, you would probably not want to use it because you have the other feature available to you. And if it is in your table and you're not going to use it, then either delete it or end it. Then I've got an, a different type of scheduling sitting out here. You can see I have two of them. I set this one up because it populates a section on the, on the header information that has data in it. So that's what that one actually does. Then the uploaded documents. This is an automated mail. <laughs> In the patient encounter record, you have the ability to upload uh, documents and attach them to the patient, either the patient or the patient encounter. And when we get to that tab, I'll go through that in a little more detail. But when you upload it there, it writes a note onto the notes tab and gives you the link to the document. The nice thing about that is if you give somebody permission to delete uploaded documents, and they go in and delete one, 
it'll write another note to the notes tab and tell you that it was deleted and who did it and, and the date. So that's, that's uh, what uh, that does. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and select one and I'll just type in a node, major cross street. <laughs> okay. Now, anywhere you have notes, and this is true for all the other modules where you could have a notes tab, the person who entered the note can make changes to the note or delete the note within 24 hours. You'll know that because you've got the date and time and it's underlined, so that made it a link. It's not a link when you've got the date and time and it's not underlined. So I entered this date, this note on one four, but I can't make any changes to it because it's not underlined. These three, you can say we're done today. So if you need to make a change to the note and you're the person that put it in, then you would select that link and add more information. So you can add more information. You can, this is also where you'd be able to delete it. So I'll just go ahead and save what I typed in. So you can see that I've changed the note. After 24 hours, then it becomes part of the notes file. And so you can, it would let this, this one see so you've got the date and time and the person who entered the note. But you would not be able to access it to remove it. Now, you're going to have notes that are no longer active or that you don't want to be active. They, they, uh, you don't need them any longer because some, another note kind of replaced them. Or you want to inactivate them to get them out of your current active list. There is a little icon that sits in front of every one of these notes where you can select that icon to deactivate it and it just takes it right out of your active list. So it's not here. Now, if you're uploading a lot of documents, I, this is what I would do. I would deactivate these that are the uploaded documents. As you can see, I've got quite a few sitting out here. So I probably deactivate those because I can get to them from my documents tab, but I can also get to them if I show my inactive. So I check the show inactive box and hit my search and it brings them back to the screen. And you can tell they're inactive because they have this little blue uh, reverse arrow icon sitting in front of the ones that are inactive. If you have one that's inactive and you wanna activate them again, maybe the note's relevant again, then all you have to do is select this little blue icon and it puts it back in the active status. So you do have the ability to get to those that are inactive. And like I said, I would most likely move any of the uploaded documents as well as maybe the fax documents into the background. Uploaded documents you can get to from the documents tab. So I'm not sure I'd want them uh, to clutter up my active notes file. Let's put this back in. <coughs> okay. You also have the ability to create a search for a keyword in here. So I'm going to just type a word in here that I know is in one of the descriptions, the word and. So everywhere when I have that word and, it's going to show me the note and where that word is in within the note itself. So you can highlight that information. Okay. I have another question. Can we sort on date, type, or note? I remember uh, just about every area you can select your headers to do the, that three-step sort. The sort is, uh, I've got all my directions together. If you hit it the opposite direction, it takes it the opposite. The third time puts it back in the original sequence. Uh, let me take this word and out and put the others back on here. So here you've got, this is a better view where you've got a variety of different ones. Just hit your type of note. There's your notes. I A to Z, hit it again, and it goes from Z to A. So it's the opposite direction. 
in one more time and it puts it back and it should be in date time sequence to start with. So you know this one should be at the top. The other thing you can do is select the type from the drop down. So if you only wanted to see uh, uh, specific notes, like let's say you just wanted to see directions, there's your direction notes. So that gives you the opportunity to filter it. Also, you can put in dates uh, from a two date. So let's say your patient's been on service for several years. You have the hundreds of facts sitting out here, but you're only interested in maybe the last three months. So you could put in from and two dates as well. That's nice for the last three months. Okay. Now, there are agencies that want to print this based on whatever filters you have. They may just want to print directions. If you filter it by directions, they may want the whole thing listed. You can print this information in a PDF format or a spreadsheet format. Whichever format you take, make sure you hit the export. PDF will show right up on the screen when, it, when it's, the report's been created. Spreadsheet may show up on the screen. You might have to open the spreadsheet. So, but it, it runs and displays on the screen. You don't have to go somewhere else to retrieve the report. You just wait for it to pop up or you open up uh, and you'll have the report available to you. So whichever option you take, just hit your export button. Your referral tab, this is where your referral information sits. And so when you're adding referrals, all of the referral information would be here for your referral source that you documented who the contact was if you put that information and all the referral information that's sitting out here. Now for home health, at the bottom of the referral information, this section, you have a place where you can update the face-to-face -face information with the physician if you want to do that uh, for home health. So you will have that for hospice that, that's not sitting down here because your face-to-face -face, uh, starts after the, or starts when you're doing your first 60-day certification period. So <clears throat> you typically would not have it here. On the referrals, you could print this referral uh, order in an order format and send it to physician for signature. If you want to do that, you can fax the referral order. So if there's a fax number for the physician and the physician's master file, you can fax it. When you receive the signed order back, then you'd be able to upload the signed order. So that, that'll put it... <coughs> That'll put it on the documents tab that you can upload it from here. Now, for the PDGM program for home health, this, this would be a good start to make sure you have your, your verbal order from the physician and that you can tell that the clinician signed it because the, or the clinician obtained it because the clinician signed it. Uh, so that you have that verbal order, that will satisfy the, the verbal order information for PDGM. There are other pieces that you have to put in the system in order to build a wrap, but that's one of the pieces that will satisfy that if you want to use it from the referral process. <clears throat> okay, so if you do need to make any changes to this, just select the edits. What I do ca caution you on making change, changes to this is the referral source. And the reason for that is if somebody came and looked at this six months from now and said, oh, the referral source should have been this doctor, not this doctor, you may have already reported your referral statistics six months ago. And so now you have different statistics because somebody changed it. You, you do have the ability to control that security permission. So, and that's something I would do. So not everybody that has access to the patient encounter, I wouldn't give everybody access to change the referral source information. I wanna control that, be maybe two people uh, could do it, maybe three. So I just, I, I would control that because especially if you've reported your referral statistics and somebody came in here and changed a bunch of them two, three, four, or five months later, then your 
statistics that you previously reported are all wrong. So if you make the change and you're the one that reported it, then you know to go ahead and redo the reports from it for that time frame. But just to arbitrarily change it and nobody know, know about it, then you go back and look and go, well, this just can't be true. Okay, so that's the referral tab. Physician facilities. Now you can add all the positions and facilities you like. This, this tab looks the same for both home health and hospice. So because you're looking at the hospice one, uh, you see adding physicians in, uh, where you can add a physician. When you do, they add it into the primary physician spot. All of your other physicians will be listed down below. So if you have multiple physicians um, that are associated with the patient's care, then you could have all the physicians down here. You could, if they've got several different specialty uh, physicians, then you can have them all listed here. Now, when you're adding a physician, this actually pulls from the uh, physician file. If you don't, if you're not quite sure of the spelling of the name, you could just leave it blank and it'll bring you the physician file A to Z. So I'm going to add um, a different physician sitting out here just so you can see this. Okay, so here, um, that one didn't do it for me. I'm sorry. When you first add them, it'll start here and when you add more, it'll start adding them to the bottom. Now, if this position is supposed to be sitting at the top, then just select the top button icon and it moves that position automatically to the top for you. If you have a different position that's supposed to be there, just select that one, moves that position to the top and moves the other one down. Now, when you're adding physicians, you'll want to identify the type of position they are and the types are listed here. Uh, this is the one that I just added. So my type is not on this, it's not been attached yet. So I'll, let me go ahead and attach the type. So if this was an attending physician, a hospitalist uh, that was involved in this patient's care at the hospital, then you could list them as an attending physician. So if you're keeping track of that, you can do that. You can also keep track of a certifying physician. This is really more for your um, hospice services. So certifying physicians that would really be your uh, hospice medical director or other hospice physician. Uh, primary care physician would be the patient's primary care physician. And when you add this one as an other physician, this would be the patient's primary care physician for hospice. Patient could have more uh, than one primary care physician. So you could have an other physician at the bottom that's also a primary care. So if they're being seen in um, like an urgent care and they uh, always see one or two doctors there, they may say those are my primary care physicians. And so you could list them here. So I have seen that. I've also seen where a physician is involved in a practice where there's uh, two physicians that share each other's patients that could both be uh, primary care physicians. So that could happen too. Then you've got the referring physician. So you may have gotten this referral uh, from somebody in a physician's practice, a uh, group practice, and he sent you the referral uh, for a physician that's on vacation. So you could keep him on file and mark him as referred as one of the other physicians. Then you've got one not for billing. I typically refer to this as a consulting physician. Um, where the uh, uh, consulting physician would, would be somebody that may be a primary care certified physician talks with that isn't truly involved with this patient's care. And you don't want them be, to be connected to the billing edit. So if you flag a physician as not for billing, then, excuse me, if you flag it for not for billing, then it won't look to see that the a physician has pay those. If you're billing Medicare, it won't look for an MPI. 
uh, it won't look for a valid state license and so on. So that's what the not for billing does. I'll just go ahead and, and uh, select this as, a, as one of these other options. Okay, I have a question. Is the edit encounter position table edited? Uh, edit encounter position table editable. Are you saying you want to you want to change it here uh, somewhere in the in uh, this list? Because you can change the position. At any at any point in time, are you saying you want to change something like their address or a phone number or something like that? We edit the table to include some other. Oh, the drop down table for the type of position. Yes, it can be changed. So, um, but if you want to change, this isn't a readily available table, but it can be easily changed. So, if you have other types of positions, like. Um, I was uh, I was thinking, and of course we've never put them in the tables, but I'd like to know if they're specialty. <laughs> so like, are they a podiatrist or an endocrinologist? I would like to know what their specialties are, because I'm sure some of these patients have uh, um, uh, orth orthopedics uh, surgeons and you know, all, all of the other specialty types. So I kind of would like to know that versus the one that's in a general practice. So uh, I'm gonna tell you yes, uh, but that's gonna be a table that, that we can edit for you. And it's really, it really is because of this one that says not for billing. So uh, that one we had to put in the table so it wouldn't look at the billing edits. Uh, that are typically required for physicians. So if you need other ones from the table, uh, just uh, contact our care patient support team and tell us what, what you want there and we'll get them in your table. Okay. All right. So that's your physician information. There is one other link sitting out here. Um, that allows you to look at and assign uh, a different address. So if the physician had two addresses, like some physicians are involved in two um, group practices, or they may have one, uh, two offices, one on each side of town. Some of the patients are seen through one office and other patients are seen through a different one. So where this address is, this is actually a link, and you can select that link and, ident and identify which address you want to go on your orders. So in this case, this patient was being seen by the physician in at this address, but now maybe the patient's moved and they're now being seen through the uh, by the physician through this office instead. So you do have that available to you. If you don't select one, so you can see I changed it. If you don't select one here, um, and it looks like this is for the other ones that are listed here. If you don't select it here and they have multiple addresses, it just picks one for the orders. So if there's no logical reason to does it pick the top one and work its way down, it just picks one. Okay. Um, okay, for last a facility stay prior to start a care. Now, a lot of locations for hospice, uh, specifically for hospice, did this within the last 30 days. They were discharged from some type of facility in the last 30 days, the last 60 days, and the last 90 days. I've seen some locations put them in here uh, six months or, or a year or maybe. Uh, two years ago, they were discharged from a facility. Not sure if the information that old is of any value to you here, but I've also seen this left blank for hospice. So uh, it's not something you do have to complete as because they may not have come from a facility or may not have ever been in one. Same with home health. Now, home health, this was originally designed as the 14 day rule. That was 14 days prior to start a care. So they kind of lifted that rule. So if you want to put the information here, you can. Uh, the information is kept 
And uh, if, if you're doing OASIS, the information is sitting on the OASIS, and it's in the, I think it's M1005, it's in that section of the OASIS. So that's really where you'd be identifying hospital stays for uh, your patients. So uh, if you're doing OASIS for the majority of your people, then that's, that's where you keep track of it. If you have patients and you do want to keep track of it, you can by all means put it here, but it doesn't do anything other than for information. Because identifying the difference between a, a, a patient uh, at the hospital level versus the community level is done through OASIS. Okay. So that's the physician facility tab. So the next one I get to move on to is the documents tab. Now the documents tab, I, I actually am in the hospice in environment, uh, in my training environment. The documents uh, tab has two sections. There's one where you can use some electronic forms that we have set up in the system. And this is also where you can upload any documents that um, you have on paper that you want to attach to the patient or the patient encounter. So we're going to uh, do the documents. Let me just go ahead and delete this one so I can start it over again, because that's the form I want to use. So to use our electronic forms, you're going to select Add Form, and then you'll have the form types that are available to you. So keep in mind, this is what's in my, my training environment, so you could have some additional for different forms when you're in production. So the, these are the types of forms. You will see these forms in production, but you'll also have some other ones. So I'm just gonna select the service agreement. So, and there is a different service agreement for home health in the system, so that, it, that they don't all look the same. Some of the documents are specific to hospice, some are specific to home health. So. Uh, you'll be able to tell the difference when you're looking at uh, the documents uh, list. Okay, so this is my service agreement. This was a very simple service agreement. Service agreements, you have patients typically reading information. So you'd hand them your device and say, can you look this over? Then you would put somebody's name out here. And let me go ahead and put a name sitting out here. Oops. And then I'm going to put in a phone number. And I'll leave the mobile phone number blank. And then you have a spot for an address. You can put in a complete address. Um, oops. This my next character. Okay, so you could put in complete address information. So when you see uh, text boxes that look like this, these are free form text boxes. So you can add numbers and letters and uh, whatever you need uh, sitting in the text box. So when you see these free form text boxes that look like this, they're single lines and they're only so long, you can put up to 250 characters in this box. So you probably don't need any more for the patient's name and their phone number and mobile phone number for sure. Address, that would be really stretching it if you have an address that was 250 characters or longer. Then you're also going to see sections where you have check boxes. These check boxes mean you can check more than one option. You will have some of these that have little radio buttons next to them. You'll only be able to select one option. Then you have more things that the patient probably needs to read, so you'll hand the information to them. And then uh, we'll go ahead and type in um, a name sitting down here. Okay, so this is one of the patient forms. If you went through the training for the associates, there were associate forms that work pretty much the same way. So I've, I've completed my patient form. I hit my apply signatures. 
And then when you're uh, looking at the information that you've completed, it's all grayed out. Because now you're going to collect signatures, that, which makes this a legally binding document. If for some reason you have some errors in here, then you need to delete this document and start over again. So you won't be able to edit any of the after you collect signatures. So I selected my apply signatures. So the next thing I'm going to do is, is collect signatures. I'm going to get the patient signature in this pen. And it, the patient's representative's name was Rex. And so I, I have a touch screen on my laptop, so I was able to sign up with my finger, but you can use a stylus. But if your laptop doesn't have a touch screen, you can use your mouse. It's a little harder to sign with, but you can use a mouse. Okay, so here's that signature. Then I've got my representative signature. Okay, so here's that representative signature. I have this already saved as the digital imprint because I've done this one another previous time. So when you sign this for the first time, you determine what type of signature you want out here. Now, this is probably something the agency um, wants to uh, define as policy, whether you want everybody to use the digital imprint or you want people to sign them individually. Let me just, and I can sign this individually. Now, if they're somebody signing it individually, make sure it has their title. If they've got a title, so you could sign it individually, or I could choose and upload a, a, a file that has a, the signature in it. So, it's either a digital imprint they sign directly on, on the screen or they sign a piece of paper that's scanned and that you can upload that scanned file uh, to obtain a likeness of their signature. So those are the three options. Um, digital imprint seems to be the nicest of the three because you can actually read them but all the time versus some of the other types of signatures that are People who have beautiful handwriting and others who couldn't tell what they wrote because all they did was draw a line across the screen. <laughs> so that would that would be something you'd probably want to establish as policy. If you're not picky about it, then what some people might use the digital imprint, some people might sign the screen, and others might have the likeness of their signature uploaded into the system. Whichever format you take, you can save it so it comes back for future use. So then once you've got the signature, just hit the accept. And so you can see I've got both signatures on the page. When you're through with uh, the document, just hit your complete. And you now have the service agreement. Now, there are locations that want to get the service agreement to the patient. Actually, I think every location does these days. Um, some of the people that collect a service agreement specifically, when they go out to that initial assessment, have portable printers. So they can print one after they get it signed and give it to the patient right then. Uh, other locations, the uh, office staff prints it and sticks it in. Uh, that clinician's inbox, so the clinician would pick it up, and the next time they see the patient, they can deliver it. And the third option I've seen is somebody just prints these every day and sticks them in the mail to the patients. So the patients have them on file. Now, I've got a spot for uploading documents. So if you're collecting anything on paper, and you want to attach it to the patient encounter, you'd want to make sure that got scanned and saved on the local PC you'd be using to upload those documents. And they can be things like <coughs> healthcare power of attorney, living will, a DNR, DNI, a consent to photograph wounds, the wound photographs, um, um, anything else that you might need that you are collecting on paper then you want to make sure that that information gets scanned and uploaded. 
The other things you can do is, let's say a physician gave you patient's medical history. You can have all of that saved um, on a local PC and upload it into a file so you can see patient's medical history. So uh, you can see hospital discharge summaries of the patient's discharge from a hospital. You can upload that to anything that you can scan and save on a local PC. You can upload uh, directly uh, into the system. Uh, can these documents, I have a question. Um, is there a way to securely email them to the patient? Not. Um, not through CareFishant. We don't have that part of the email to CareFishant, but you could print them and uh, save them in files instead of print them on paper, and then you can send encrypted emails to the patient. So that is a, a workaround, but we don't have any way to do that uh, through the system. And then the other question. Can these documents be put directly into the patient portal? And I'm going to tell you, uh, you might be referring more to the forms, and I'm going to tell you, no, we don't have that capability at this time. Uh, it is something that we have talked about. We just don't have the capability at the moment. So it's, it's uh, not like we're not thinking about it, but it's not there yet. That was a good question. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> now, when you upload these uh, documents, you're going to select your upload document link. You're going to be choosing a file. I'm going to choose one I don't already have. So I'm just um, looking at all power returning. All right. So let me go ahead and choose one that I don't already have. I may have a facility discharge summary that I received from that facility. So I'm going to select this. This is on my um, uh, PC, this file that I've got saved here. So I'm going to go ahead and save it and, and upload it. So here's my document that I'm going to be uploading into the system. Now the patient um, encounter file, you have two different ways you can attach the documents. You can attach them to the encounter, which means that document specifically uh, is specifically for this one encounter, or you can attach it to the patient, which means that it, when you attach it to the patient, every time you discharge and readmit the patient, you will have that document. So I typically see if you have a consent to photograph the, the patient and upload the patient's photograph, that it gets attached to the patient. If you're um, providing wound care during the admission and you are, um, have a consent form to photograph the wound and the wound photographs themselves, they typically get attached to the encounter because they pertain to that specific encounter. If you discharge and admit that patient, then the consent to photograph the wounds and the, and the photographs do not flow to the next encounter. If you attach it to the patient, like the consent to have the patient's photograph on file, uh, and you upload the patient's, uh, the consent and the photograph, you link it to the patient. Every time you discharge and admit the patient, it'll go with them. So that's the difference. So if you think about what it would be more unique to the encounter versus what would be general to the patient. Now, if you are doing paper service agreements, that's unique to the encounter because you don't have a service agreement that once you discharge the patient, you readmit them again, you have to get a new one. So those are unique to uh, that specific encounter. You could put patient's medical history from the physician uh, at the patient level, so you can see it all plus, so you have all the background while you're working with the current admission. This facility discharge summary, that's kind of a 50-50 thing. Do I want to see it because it really is part of the patient history? Do I want to see it at the patient level or do I want to see it at the encounter level? So I would be inclined for this one 
If I just charge the patient and readmit them, I would have the patient's medical history from the physician in the next encounter. I might be inclined to see what the facility discharge summary is. So I might be inclined to attach it to the patient. And I select the document type. Now, this is also a table. <coughs> Some of the items in the table uh, can um, be changed. So we use some of these items uh, uh, to do a couple other things in the system, but some of these items in the table can be changed, actually the majority of them. And you can add new items to this table. So I'm doing a, a document type. And if I'm saying that uh, this was uh, a facility discharge summary, I have that listed here. And so that just it tells me the type of documents I'm putting in. Uh, uh, the document status, well, this is actually completed. You could have a document status that says completed slash signed um, if, if that's one you think you need versus one that just says complete. Also have an option of no action needed. Maybe there's nothing that needs to be done other than uploading the document. I'm gonna go ahead uh, the, uh, uh, I was just reading another one. We don't think the document type was recorded. Um, I actually uh, don't have that set up, so I couldn't review it with you. Um, Molly, uh, let me make a note of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I was just making a note of it. That's part of the big pause with me talking, but I'll make a, a note of that. Um, I don't have anything set up to, to show that once. You're the first person that's ever asked me about that. <laughs> okay. So that's uh, when you upload the document, you can identify the status of that document. Uh, I'll give you some examples of what some people do. I probably would not do this, but I'll just give you an example. If you print and mail order versus fax it or uh, send it to, uh, to the physician through the physician's portal, if you print and mail it to the physician for signature, some locations put that uh, printed document here as an incomplete document. Then when you get it back signed by the physician, if they send you a paper copy back signed, then they come in and delete that document and put in the signed one. I'm not sure I'd do that uh, because your orders tab will keep track of when you send the information out. You can recreate the picture of the order if you needed to um, and send it back to the physician again. You can do all those things. So I don't think I'd put the incomplete one out here and then once I get the signature back, put the completed one because I can recreate the incomplete one. But we have offices that do that. It's incomplete, not signed. They delete it and come back and have another one. Just seems like a double work to me. Now, when you're adding a document, you can add a, a, an additional description. And I'll, I'll explain to you um, what it does. So you'll see this. Okay, you can also add some additional notes for this document. You can upload and add more. And you can, if so, if you've got two or three documents you want to do, we just hit after you've uploaded this one, hit your upload and add more. And once you're through uploading all your documents, just hit your upload and close. And so now what this does is it writes that note. So I, I uh, added my note. Yeah, I'm signed in correctly. It, um, my training environment uh, drags a little bit, but you, know, I would have my note listed here that I've uploaded it and that it's marked complete. Then it will also on the notes tab, write that uploaded document note. So you'll see it in both places. Okay, so that's that's the document tab. Now the, uh, the clinical tab. 
the clinical tab, there are definitely some uh, major differences between home health and hospice. So I'm going to show you the hospice one first, and then I'll bring up the home health uh, clinical tab so you can see the difference. And I will and I will explain some of the things that are saying as I go through this. So the clinical tab, you're also going to learn how to use this clinical tab in the clinical training. So it's kind of a shared uh, type thing because both your uh, administrative people as well as your uh, clinicians in the field would be updating and using this information. So the first section has the clinical team. You can assign a, a case manager. Now, case manager is usually the that the lead clinician that's out in the field, like an RN, if you have therapy on it, they could be, uh, the therapist could be a case manager. So that's usually somebody that's kind of overseeing or taking charge of the patients out in the field. A clinical manager is your clinical supervisor or manager in the office. And the, that individual um, may have several case managers reporting to them. So when you're assigning your case manager and clinical manager, this actually pulls from the list of associates. So th th that's where this information comes from. It is a listing out of the associate master file. So that's where you'd be able to select and assign them. And it does that both for the clinical and case manager. And it pulls their phone numbers out there, the preferred one. So that's where all that information comes from. Then you have the ability to assign an entire clinical team to your patients. Now, I see this used a lot for hospice. A home health, it might be a 50-50, but it, and, um, and I, I find it a useful feature, but it's not mandatory, but I do see this a lot for hospice. They seem to be able to build their clinical teams a little easier than, than home health does. All right, so this is where you can identify all of the, the caregivers by discipline and which one is the primary one, which is typically the one that would be uh, assigned to the patient's schedule. So this would be like the the primary, uh, in this case, hospice aid I have checked, this would be the primary uh, social worker, this would be the primary nurse, and so on. I want to show you a little trick to deciding this because uh, when you're selecting your edit, this is in alphabetical sequence by uh, patients or by associates' name. I find it easier if I just erase just by selecting discipline. <laughs> so I made sure that I got it all covered for every discipline rather than trying to find the names to the list. I could have a nurse that has last name is an, an A and the, the other nurse, their last name is an S. So I don't want to have to be sliding through this whole thing when all I have to do is look through a smaller section. So I opened up this pop up and I sorted it by just so these headers will allow you to sort them as well. So you can see they're sorted by discipline. So here I have two chaplains. This is this is the one that should be typically assigned to the patient schedule. And this is their backup. Then you can see I've got several hospice aides. This one should be assigned to the patient schedule, but I have multiples assigned as their backups. So I've got uh, four altogether, but three of them are the backups. So if this individual is not able um, to provide service on a specific day or a specific week, then you don't know who the backups are. These backups should all be familiar with this patient's uh, needs. And so you can see that. And so when I slide a little further down, I, here's my nurses group. So you can see here's my primary and I have two backups. Primary, again, is the one that should be assigned to the patient schedule for the most part. Also, when you're working with this, and I don't have one checked, but if this was a primary nurse, maybe they weren't the nurse that did the initial assessment or they weren't the admitting nurse, you could find uh, a different one for that. Let's say this person was the admitting nurse. You could check that 
for the admitting nurse. And then this gives you your entire clinical team and the ones that have the green check marks are the ones that you would typically apply to this patient's schedule. <clears throat> Okay, for uh, chaplain, uh, or I'm sorry, for disciplines, this, this information starts during the referral process. So that screen where you uh, check off the disciplines uh, that are gonna be providing service, that's where this screen starts. So to give you an example, and this is sitting in both home health and, and uh, hospice environment. So just to give you an example, if, if you were, if you had just a skilled nurse checked off, when this comes in, all you will uh, as a re, uh, referral, which created a pending patient encounter, all, all it will show is skilled nurse. Then once you go up and check the patient and you say, mm, you know, they need some other services, then it, let's say they, you know, they need a social worker and a hospice aid. So on your care plan, you're putting in a hospice aid and social worker. Now, if, if once the social worker goes out there and says, okay, we know this person's religion and they would like the chaplain, then we also need the volunteer. Then if you're doing this on an interim order, you'll see all of this. So that's where this, this comes from. It starts from the disciplines you checked off during the referral and any additional disciplines you add to the care plan or interim orders will update this section. So I, I see this more often for home health. Uh, in hospice, you have chaplain, hospice aide, skilled nurse, social worker, and volunteer. Those are typically the ones that would be checked during the referral process. In home health, I typically see this one checked and the nurse says, you know what, uh, need a, a social worker and a, and a home health aid. So then you'd be able to uh, put that on the orders for home health and uh, any interim orders uh, during that certification period. So that's where that information comes from. Starts with the referral and works with care plan uh, for hospice and 485 orders and interim orders for unit one. Okay. So since I'm in a hospice patient, you're going to see the level of care information listed here. This is where you identify the level of care. So when you first activate the patient, you admit them on service, you identify the initial level of care. So my patient start of care, I was just uh, to show you here. Here's my patient start of care. When I activated the patient on 7-7, seven, seven, sorry, when I activated the patient on 7-7, I set them up with routine care. Then on 7-15, I had to move them to continuous care. So I came in here, uh, selected the routine care link, put in the end date on the 14, and then I added the continuous care and started it on the 15. Then when I'm taking them out of, uh, uh, continuous care and I'm going to put them into another level of care. Then I would come back and do the continuous care and put in an end day. So I did my continuous um, home care uh, and I said I'm moving them back into routine care. So I ended this on 719, put them in routine care on 720. Then on 731, I had to take them out of routine care to, and had to, and I put them in respite for uh, several days. So as soon as they're out of respite, I'll come in and end that and move them to one of the other level of cares. This is the information that drives the billing. So you want to make sure that you have this up to date all the time because it determines whether you're billing for routine care and when, continuous care when, general inpatient and when and respite. So this, this is the information that's going to drive those billing pieces. So make sure that you have this up to date all the time. Vendors, you can, both home health and hospice, you can put in vendors for uh, both service types uh, and you also have a private duty. Uh, but you, you'll have the same information. So this will work for private duty too. You can put in the vendors 
So for a hospice, they would most likely be the uh, DME and su a supply vendor and your a pharmacy that you use. Some locations, uh, hospice locations use more than one pharmacy. So they will list whatever pharmacies they use for the patient. Uh, and I know a couple of locations have, have different DME supply companies, depending on what city they're in. So you could list all those too. Now, if you're doing hospice, if the patient is uh, also being seen by their uh, primary care physician and some of these other specialty physicians and they've provided uh, prescriptions that are not, not covered by hospice care, they may be getting those from somewhere else, but you can list them here as well. Disaster plans. Now, when you're doing your disaster plan, this is a table you want to make sure that meets the strictest of all the requirements, which are your state, I'm sorry, your federal state, as well as your office policy that meets the strictest of all requirements. <laughs> now, when you're assigning a disaster plan from the table that you have set up, you will also be able to put in plan details. So um, you may have one person that's signed level two, like this one that says that the, uh, uh, the, the service can be postponed uh, and with just telephone contact and uh, the caregiver will be doing basic care in emergency situations and so on. Versus you might have another one that's a level two that maybe, maybe the phone contact is every day versus every other day or every third day. It also defined really the basic reason why you selected this disaster plan option. And then, and then other information that's needed. If you select one of those that the patient isn't able to leave their home on their own, then you can define how they're gonna leave their home. Is family gonna take them? Are their neighbors gonna take them? Where are they going? Um, and how long do you, you anticipate them being there? Um, how, what's the transportation mode? Do they need to go by ambulance versus car? Um, so that's the kind of information you can put in for the plan details. So you can customize the plan that you selected to each individual patient. Okay, the advanced directives. On the advance uh, directives, this is where if you are collecting them, you can put them in. So I have my D DNR sitting in, out here. Living will is an advanced directive. <coughs> Some locations have a DNR and a DNI. Um, healthcare power of attorneys, but we consider advanced directives. So this is where you could put it. Um, I see a, a note out here in the plan details. Can we have pre written templates that can be pulled in and I'm going to tell you yes and what it does and I'll show you this. There's a little icon that sits next to this for suggested text. So there is a table that you can set up for suggested text for any one of these so that you'd be able to select that. I don't think I have any in my uh, files. Let me look real quick. No, I don't think I have any in this one. But yes, you can have some uh, pre-scripted uh, templates. And then when you do that, it brings it in, into the screen and you can edit it if you need to. Okay, I, I have to admit when you look at this one that I have for my example, this is a lot of data to be putting in. And I, you know, I look at this like this one, the care for this patient may be postponed with telephone contact, could be every three days. And so if I wanted that, it just said every, and I type in three days, two days, five days, and so on. And the patient's gonna be taken by, and you could type in, you know, ambulance, a family's vehicle, truck, bus, however they're gonna get around. So you could just fill in the blanks with the, with the templates. And that is a table. Um, I haven't done this one in a long time, but it is a table for, I do believe it's under the patient. 
Um, I'll, I'll find that and let you know where, where the table sits exact, exactly so that you'll know where to put that in. I went and spend a little time trying to kind of find it for you. But we can make it on the board too. I'm going to make the displays and then he suggested text for um, the best of that. Okay. I'll get, I'll get that to you. All right. Okay. Um, adding DME, this is where you can put all the DME uh, that, that the patient has. Now, for hospitals, you put all the DME that you've ordered that was sitting out here. You also need to put in a return date when the DME is returned. Now, when you discharge the patient, and any of these DME items do not have a return date, WorkDesk is going to tell you you need to make arrangements to go pick it up. Now, for home health, they may have made other arrangements for their DME. So, uh, it's it's on their dime. So um, if you discharge them and they still have the DNA in their home, that's not a problem. But for hospice, once you discharge the patient, you get a work basket saying that any item that doesn't have a return date in it is listed here. Then for, um, I'll come back to consensus notices in a minute. Okay, so for uh, vaccines, for hospice, you do have uh, vaccines that you can uh, work with. This is in a different spot in home health. And so I will be showing you the home health side of this in a, a few minutes, but this is where uh, you'd be able to document vaccines for all your patients. It's got a nice extensive list of all the different types of vaccines. So. Hopefully we have them all covered in that table. If not, they can be uh, um, added to the table. So we gave you, uh, I think, a pretty complete table to start with. And so if you need others in there, they can be added to the table. So you've got that table you can customize. Okay, let's talk about the consent and notices section. This one, it, it, the, the whole section could look different based on how you're handling your consents and notices. I'm going to tell you you need to have at least um, a couple of these. You need to have the assignment of benefits, and I'll explain why there's two of them in a minute. So you need to have the assignment of benefits and a date here. You're going to have to have the patient's signature and a date here, and the release of medical information and a date here. When you submit electronic claims to Medicare for whether it's home health or hospice, these fields are populated. So this one says you have assignment of benefits uh, and the answer is yes. So that should be part of your service agreement. For Medicare, that means that they're gonna send you the payment, not the patient, and that you're accept accepting that payment as payment in full so that you will not be rebilling the patient for anything that Medicare didn't pay for. So that's what that yes means for Medicare. And signatures down here, B means that you have their signature on file. So your patient consent for treatment form, you should also have a date with it. So this B goes on, on an electronic claim saying you have the patient's signature on file because you've collected it here. Then this release of information, your uh, patient consent for treatment form should have a section in it for release of any information. That's going to say yes. So that tells you on an electronic claim that you can send uh, the payer, when they ask you for any medical information, you can send it to them. If they said no, you wouldn't be able to. So that's why you need to have all of that information included in your consent for treatment form. Now, let me explain the difference between these two. And I think one of these days I'll get my training environment updated. You have two, you should have two different types of uh, assignment of benefits for. Um, 
uh, patient care. So your service agreement can have it all listed in the same one, but you should have two different types. This one is typically for Medicare, so where the description says yes, then you've got uh, the assignment of benefits for, for Medicare, saying that you're, they're going to send the payment to you, and you're accepting that payment as payment in full. The other assignment of benefits and this really should be documented in your service agreement. And, it's, and I see this more for uh, maybe Medicaid's insurance, other third parties, and so on. But this one says that the payment source is going to send you the payment, not the patient. And you can bill anything that they did not pay for, like deductibles, co-pays, um, non-covered services. So you really should have two different types of assignment of benefits, one for Medicare payers and one where you can uh, fill uh, the patient or other payers for the balance of what that primary payer did not pay for. So it, it, that's, that's why I have two of them on the screen. One of these should say Medicare on them. So I just have never gotten around to changing, but that's what that is. And so the rest of this information, depending on your form, a lot of uh, locations have altered their form. So the patient consent for treatment includes the bill rates for services, all of this assignment of bene benefit information, patient bill of rights information, whatever else you'd be collecting at one point. Every one of these was a separate form and the patient had to sign every single one of them. And so over the years, they all uh, were combined into one form. So hopefully you have one of those smart forms that has everything on it you need so the patient only has to sign it once. And so that's, that's why I have some of these others listed here. So if you everything is all included in your patient consent for treatment, then you wouldn't have this one. Probably wouldn't have this one. Um, probably wouldn't need this one because it's in the consent for treatment uh, form. And so the, your list will probably be smaller than mine. Um, okay. question. I'm so, sorry to interrupt. I, I'm, we're noticing that it's uh, almost 1240. And I'm just oh, wondering, because of everybody's time, uh, how much longer you you need? Uh, what I, I probably about five minutes, because I wanted to show you what this specific screen looked like. I didn't re realize we were going along so so quickly. Uh, I just want to show you what this uh, what this screen looks like in a home health or private duty agency, so that you can see the difference. I've explained most of it, but I just want you to see what it looks like. Thank you for catching that. A lot of times when I just talk and I lose all track of time. Last I looked, I thought it said at the top of the hour. Goodness. Okay. All right, so let me go grab my patient that's got this screen on it so you can see truly the difference. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the same clinical tab. Pretty much everything else is the same, but some of the things have been moved around. So you still have your clinical team and you can still do uh, all the assignments the same way, all the other information the same. In hospice, you don't have the specialty skills or programs. Um, I find that the majority of locations don't use specialty skills. And I think that all the locations don't use the programs, but um, what the programs does is it allows you, if you do have a specialties program, uh, a specialty program, you could link patients to them. So you still have your vendors and vac uh, vaccinations, your disaster plans, advanced directives, consent for treatment, and DME. In, in your uh, home health side of all of this, which would be the same for private duty, 
you also can set vital sign per parameters for an individual patient. So you'd be able to do all of that too. Okay, so the rest of these tabs, the medications, the orders, the service notes, these are all, uh, you're gonna learn all about these as part of the clinical training. Uh, when we did the referral, we went through the payer. Um, EVV, when you're ready to switch over to an EVV process, our clinical team will be teaching you that too. I did have a question here. It says, how do you view the forms listed? Um, are you talking about, uh, this was from uh, Stacey, are you talking about these forms uh, on the screen, like the assignment of benefits, bill rates for services? Are you talking about these types of forms? Uh, if you are, and these are really your paper documents, and so they would be um, what you'd be working with. So if you want to use our electronic forms, um, if they need to have some tweaks made to them, we could do some tweaks. Doesn't mean we'll add all new forms or make major changes to it. Um, I think you've got some that you can, but these are really your forms. So uh, if you need to see the forms that you've uploaded, there will be a link here that you can link to an uploaded document, just like you can the advanced directive. So that's what these forms are. So, and if, if you get them all to be electronic, then they'll all be electronically uh, used from this documents tab, the form section. Okay, I don't have any other questions. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending today's training. I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and a great weekend. And Thanks, we'll Greg. And thank we'll you. talk to you next thank week. You. Okay, thanks. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye. <laughs>